Ok, good morning everyone. Uh, I am Massimiliano Marcellino. I am a professor of econometrics here at Bocconi and I'm in charge of the local organizing committee of the, of the program. But here in particular, I would like to welcome you to this uh, Bocconi invited lecture by Victor Chernozukov. And as you know, Victor is a statistician, an economist, and an econometrician based at MIT. Uh, with very broad research interests that cover causal inference with high dimensional data, applications of machine learning methods, counterfactual and policy analysis, distribution and quantile methods, uh, shape restrictions, partial identification, and extreme value theory, just to mention the main areas in which uh, Victor has worked. And Victor has published extensively in all of these fields, and he has a great citation record, so he has over 24,000 citations in Google Scholar, which is just another indicator of its impact on the profession. And Victor is also a recipient of the Arnold Zelder Award, the Best Sell Award, and he delivers several invited lectures at previous meetings of the Econometric Society, like the, the Cowles Lecture, the Fischer Schulz, the Annan, and, and the, Sun, the Sargan Lectures. And also, and I would say very important, Victor is also the co-organizer of the new interdisciplinary PhD program in statistics at MIT and of the new uh, bachelor in computer science, economics, and, uh, and data science. And uh, uh, you know, here at Bocconi, we also have introduced the bachelor degree in economics, management, and computer science. And recently, we also started the master of science degree in data science and business analytics, uh, because as you know better than me, these are becoming very hot uh, topic and areas also in the private sector. And in addition, at Bocconi, we just opened a, a, a department fully dedicated to computing science, which is led by Riccardo Zecchina. And uh, the goal of this department is to become a premier European center for interdisciplinary research in computing and also a hub of interdisciplinary research with other departments within Bocconi and within other universities. And the research areas of the computing department include uh, digital humanities, artificial intelligence for images and text, uh, with application to various areas such as uh, management, finance, economics, and so on. But they will also work on bioinformatics, fintech and blockchain, secure computations, privacy, computational methods in statistics, uh, and, and so on. And so since Victor contributed to many of these fields, we are particularly happy that he accepted our invitation to deliver this uh, special invited uh, Bocconi lecture that, uh, as you can see, will be on causal inference uh, using machine learning. Thanks a lot and welcome. Yeah, thank you very much for the uh, introduction. Um, so this uh, lecture will be about um, using machine learning to address causal inference questions in economics. Um, <clears throat> we started to work in this area a long time ago, maybe about 15 years ago. And then, of course, over time, there's a big team of collaborators that collaborated on different aspects. And I'm going to present some of the latest, uh, latest work in this um, area, because I think as we do more work, we learn a lot more. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So the, uh, the outline is going to be um, as follows. Um, I will focus the presentation on a simple framework, simple, easy framework that's also going to be general at the same time, not, not of full generality, but uh, general enough to cover lots of leading examples. And, uh, and this framework is going to be about uh, learning and bounding causal effects in empirical work by uh, relying on machine learning. Machine learning is also known as, as, as adaptive statistical learning methods, although like the, the word statistical method is boring and machine learning is more fun. So that's why people use the word machine learning. So, but there's no, there's not really a difference. So it's just branding, right? Anyway, so the list of the examples that we're gonna cover, it's going to be uh, number one, the average potential outcomes, for example, average policy values under different policies average treatment effects, including subgroup effects, weighted average derivatives, causal derivatives, like elasticities, for example, demand elasticities, average effects from transporting covariates. So like imagine you increase a unit 
of education for a, uh, for a worker and you want to see what's the effect on wages. So that's the, um, so you transport the covariates by increasing uh, them by a unit. You can also study the average effects from distributional changes in covariates and that shows up in the decomposition analysis, the Oxica binder type decomposition analysis. Anyway, so many other examples are going to fall in this framework, but we're just going to focus on um, uh, focus on a couple of running examples in the presentation. Now, here, the using my machine learning is potentially um, very fruitful here because we can learn the regression functions and other pieces that will show up in the formulation like, very well, so we can approximate regression functions very well. Okay, but there are going to be issues. So then why do I say like very well? Well, like we, we can easily measure the predictive performance of machine learning tools, right? For predicting Y or predicting other um, outcomes, and they uh, by by doing sample splitting. And then uh, one example, like one example after another, they just perform better. And these days, we we all are users of machine learning, even without knowing about it. Like when you go shopping online. You do search, you, you have like a, a recommendation, suggestions listed to you. That's actually powered by machine learning. Or you do like Google translation, that's also powered by machine learning and all this, right? Um, so, it's, uh, so these tools emerged in the last 30 years and they are really, really great for, uh, for predictive purposes. However, there's going to be a problem for causal inference. So the, what the ML does, it, it shrinks, chops, and throw, throws, uh, like, uh, throws out variables to, for, to perform prediction uh, very well in high dimensional settings. So you have like lots of lots of covariates. You're doing prediction. You're gonna throw out some. You're gonna uh, you're gonna penalize uh, to not to overfit too much, and and that's gonna uh, that's actually gonna induce some biases in causal learning. So these regularization and selection biases they transmit into estimation of the main causal effects. But we can actually overcome these biases by using carefully crafted um, the so-called Neiman orthogonal score functions or moment functions. And in, in addition, there will be some unexpected overfitting biases that we can eliminate by sample splitting or cross-fitting. Okay. So some biases we can eliminate, but there are, like the, there are actually bigger biases out there. So another source of the bias is going to be the presence of the unobserved confounders. These biases cannot be eliminated. These are big biases. They cannot be eliminated. If I told you that they could be eliminated, I should be fired right away. Uh, they cannot be eliminated, like fundamentally cannot be eliminated, but we can try to, uh, to bound these biases by making various um, hypotheses, making assumptions about the strengths of confounding. Um, and that's going to be the second, second part of my presentation is going to be ab about that. So anyway, so I'm going to describe the setup, and the setup is going to be the standard setup that is uh, uh, like very familiar to you from, uh, from, uh, from the introductory econometrics courses. So we're going to operate in this potential outcome uh, frameworks uh, that, you can, uh, that you can look up in Rubin and Imbens, Imbens and Rubin book. So here, YD, uh, YD is going to denote the potential outcome in a, in, in, in a, policy, uh, in a policy state. Uh, yeah. In the policy state D, the, the, the chosen policy, uh, which is going to be denoted by the capital D, is going to be assumed to be independent of the potential outcomes, conditional on the set of controls or confounders, X and A. So I'm going to have a two separate li list of uh, controls, X and A. In the first part of my talk, X and A are going to be both observed. And in the second part of the talk, A will become unobserved. So that's going to create this big bias that, that I mentioned. Okay. So this is called, in classical econometrics, this is called conditional exogeneity. So this 1.1 is called conditional exogeneity assumption. Um, then the, the, um, the observed outcome, and, and in the stats, it's called conditional ignorability and other names. Uh, so the observed outcome is going to be generated as one of the potential outcomes, de depending on what the chosen policy was. And under this conditional exogeneity condition, it is a standard result that we can identify the conditional average potential outcome by just uh, regression, right? So if we 
So this, the, the conditional expectation of the potential outcome given, uh, given the controls is going to be equal to the conditional expectation of the actual outcome given, uh, given the controls and given that the policy variable uh, hits the state little d. Okay. So we're going to denote this uh, regression function by g. Um, and that's a standard identification result in, uh, that underlies um, the use of regression in empirical uh, analysis, right? So we're gonna, uh, we're gonna introduce a couple of running examples of the target parameters here. So the, the, the typical target parameters that we're interested in in empirical work are the average causal effect. So for example, if the uh, policy variable is binary, uh, then we can, uh, we, we can study this average causal effect, which is the expectation of the difference in the two potential outcomes in the treated state and the untreated state, control state. And the, uh, under the previous assumption, the conditional exogeneity assumption, it is identified as the average difference between the two regression functions, right? So that's for the binary D. When, uh, when, the, when the D is continuous, say it's price, and we, we're doing elasticity, um, uh, demand elasticity analysis, the target parameter could be something like uh, average, average elasticity, for example. So that's the average elasticity. And uh, we can identify it by the average derivative of the regression function. Okay. So there are, of course, other useful examples that, they, 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 that we can mention here, but uh, I will not be mentioning them like afterwards. Another example is the average incremental effect. So here, so let's say D is education. So it's not binary, but let's say you increase education by one and you want to see the effect on the average effect on wages. Um, so that's the d definition of the, uh, the effect. And it's identified as also as a functional of this regression uh, function. Another one is the average policy effect from the covariate shifts. Like you, um, you change the distribution of covariates so this is called composition effect in the Oxaca binder decomposition. And that one is also identified as a particular linear uh, functional of the, re uh, the, uh, the regression function. Okay, so there's a bunch of examples that we uh, we're going to be covering, and I'm going to use these two examples as my running, uh, running examples. So here's the first part of the uh, talk today. So that's going to be, um, that's, that's, uh, that, uh, here we, we will suppose that there are no unobserved confounders. So we observe um, X and A, both X and A. So there are no missing uh, uh, the, the, uh, the variables. There are no omitted variables here. And in the general framework, we're going to formulate our target parameter <coughs> as a, as an expression that you see in the formula 2.1. So you have theta. It's going to be expectation over some formula m applied to data vector w and also indexed by g, the, our regression function. OK, and then uh, this general formulation actually trivially covers the examples that I just talked about. So for the uh, average causal effect, the m, uh, the m formula is just a difference in the g's. For the derivatives, the m formula is the derivative of the g and so on and, and so forth. So the only non-trivial non part of the assumption here is this continuity assumption. And we need some kind of uh, overlap conditions for this continuity assumption to hold. But this is where it gets technical. And you can, you can look it up in, um, in, in the papers. Yeah, and uh, by, by the way, I want to mention the slides also contain, yeah, they contain references, they contain code links like you, that you can click and they, they're going to take, uh, take you, it's going to take you to kegel.com or googleclub.com where you, you have preloaded data sets for you to explore these methods. So it's, this is all um, really accessible. Anyway, so the key observation uh, to all the analysis is, is going to be the following uh, lemma, which is based, uh, which is derived from the Ritz uh, of, uh, representation theory, so that uh, application of this theory uh, will tell us that, that there, there exists a unique square integrable random variable alpha of w such that our uh, parameter, target parameter, could alternatively be represented as the inner product or correlation, loosely speaking, or covariance, covariance between the g and the alpha. Okay. 
So this uh, sounds a little bit abstract, but in fact, you actually have seen it, right? So you've seen this in the asset pricing because alpha, like in the asset pricing, alpha is just a stochastic discount factor. So this is used a lot in like asset pricing, for example. Um, and over here as well, like, like let's go, let's get back to the econometric example. So you actually have seen these uh, reads representers before, but maybe without realizing that, they, that these are reads representers. So let's um, let's look at this. Um, 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 partially linear example. So he, in, in this partially linear example, we will suppose that the G, the regression function, is partially linear in the policy variable. So we have the theta times D plus some nonlinear function of X and A. So it turns out that the, the Ritz representer for this problem is just the, the policy variable after partialing out the, the X and A's. So you, you, you take the Ritz representer, you take the policy variable, you subtract off the prediction of this policy variable given x and a, and you know you scale it by the variance. And so it turns out that this uh, this uh, for this uh, Ritz representer, this formula is going to just recover the theta that we have here, right? So this is uh, you could view that uh, this example here as uh, as kind of Frischwa, like the revisiting Frischwa from a different angle and just realizing this is what the Frischwa partialing out does for us here. So it actually is a, it's a way to construct a, a Ritz uh, representer here, okay? And by the way, why do I need this uh, Ritz representation? You'll see later that's gonna be a critical part of the framework. Okay, so let's, uh, that's a partially linear example, so that's easy maybe, but let's go to the fully nonlinear examples. So for the fully nonlinear examples, the Ritz representers, they're gonna vary depending on, the, on, on your target functional. So like in the, for the average causal effects, the binary for the binary treatment, the Ritz representer turns out to be something uh, familiar as well. It's actually the Horvitz-Thompson transform, right? So this is, uh, you have the indicator of the policy vi uh, visiting the treatment state, normalized by the probability of visiting that state, minus the indicator of treatment uh, being in the control state, normalized by the probability of being in that state, right? And you can verify that that's going to represent, like this, uh, this re uh, representer um, is the right one to represent the average causal effect in this, in this formula by just using Bayes uh, formulas, right? Uh, finally, for the average causal derivatives, we could say, okay, so what's the Ritz representer here? So like, okay, so here we want to, on, on the, on the left-hand side, we want to have something like average derivative, and on the, on the right side, we want to have no derivative. How do we get rid of derivatives? Well, we do integration by parts, right? And so using integration by parts, we can verify that under mild conditions, um, this is going to be the uh, the Ritz representer. So this is a logarithmic derivative of the conditional density of the policy given X and A. And we can go on with other examples, but, uh, but maybe this, uh, the, this last example is, it, uh, starts to look a little bit more co like, uh, complicated, right? Maybe not from the formula point of view, but, but from estimation point of view. Later on, I'll have to estimate my Ritz representers. And estimating con derivatives uh, of the densities in high dimensions uh, it might, it might appear challenging. So it actually turns out we don't need any of these analytical formulas. We can actually provide an automatic characterization or variational characterization for these uh, re Ritz representers through this uh, optimization problem. So it turns out that they, uh, like just knowing the formula for M, which, uh, we, which we, all, we know because it defines the parameter of interest for us, uh, we can retrieve the Ritz representer by solving the optimization program where we minimize the square, the expectation of the square of the uh, candidate representer minus two. Then we have this formula M applied to the data vector. And instead of A, uh, so instead of G, uh, G there, we have the A. And so this is like a computational uh, characterization of the Ritz representer and it turns out to um, to be very uh, handy in, in practice. Um, so you can use it as a basis for, uh, for estimating the Ritz representers in any, in any problem, in any problem. So, and we did develop uh, uh, various methods based on penalized regressions, uh, random forests, and uh, neural networks to estimate the Ritz representers. So how do we see that this is, uh, 
uh, this is the right optimization problem to solve. Well, you can set up the first order conditions for this problem, right? The derivative sh should be zero at the optimum. This is convex optimization problem. So the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the first order con conditions characterize the optimum, but the first order conditions actually turn out to be that. So you take the derivative in direction G and, uh, and, and the first order conditions, they turn out to be the expressions that you see in this formula. So this is uh, this is quite uh, quite uh, um, handy. Okay, so we've done all of this preparatory work, and now we could say, okay, now we have several ways to represent the target parameter. One is what we started with. Another one is uh, is this expression from the representation lemma. And there's another one in the middle uh, that you can obtain by the law of iterated expectations. And so you could uh, maybe call this first piece the regression matching approach, loosely speaking, right? Uh, the second piece is going to be the propensity score matching approach. And this is kind of some kind of third mixed approach. And the question is, okay, so I have all of these ways of getting my causal parameter, which one should I use? It turns out that in parametric problems, you can use any one of them, and, and as long as you're careful with how you get standard errors, like everything works fine. And there are pros and cons for, for different, uh, different methods. In low dimensional non-parametric, classical non-parametric, still like it's, it's the same, uh, uh, you get the same results. You can use any of the approaches and you're fine. So as long as you're doing some kind of under smoothing and all that. But in high dimensions, in high dimensions, we cannot, uh, this no longer works, right? So in, in, in modern high dimensional settings, we have to use heavy regularization. We cannot do uh, smoothing. And we're using this machine learning to learn the G and the alphas, uh, um, right? So we, uh, in principle, we can learn the Gs and alphas well, but there is like regularization bias on the one hand. So yeah, we are throwing out variables, we are penalizing co coefficients and all that. So that introduces a regularization biases, and that actually transmits into the estimation of, uh, of the main causal parameter of interest. So here I have a simulation experiment where um, I plot the finite sample distribution of the t-statistics. So I have my estimator of based on this formula, or, you know, obviously I don't have the population expectation, but I can take the empirical expectation here. I could estimate the G. So here I'm going to estimate the G by uh, like random forest. It's supposed to wor work well in this Monte Carlo experiment because the the the, the true G is is uh, has a structure where random forest is supposed to work well. But what I get as a finite sample distribution for my T statistic is is uh, something that looks like this, this histogram. Uh, okay, ideally I would like to see a Gaussian distribution centered at around zero. What I see instead is something that is not centered at zero, it's five standard deviations away from zero. And it, the distribution is also not Gaussian, it has like much heavier, heavier tails uh, than the Gaussian. So you, ca you can't really use this distribution for, for inference. So yeah, there's a bias problem, non-Gaussian uh, and non-Gaussian uh, non distribution problem. So how do we overcome this regularization bias? Well, we have to narrow the path. So we cannot use all of these approaches, but we can combine all of these approaches in the following way. So we could take, uh, we could take this original formula for, th for theta and then add and subtract these two pieces. And intuitively, intuitively what's going to happen here, each part is going to correct for the bias in the other part. So let's say if, if we are a little bit wrong in G, so our, uh, this part is going to deviate from theta, but this bias is going to be canceled by, by this. Vice versa, if we are a little bit off, if we're a little bit wrong in alpha, like over here, then this, pop, uh, this part is going to take care of that, uh, of that bias. Okay? So you, you, you get, uh, you remove, by using this formula, you remove first order biases. 
and uh, and uh, if if we compare the two pictures now we okay compare the two pictures we were five standard deviations away from zero and now we are 2.5 standard deviations away from zero much better but still like pretty bad right so this debiasing is helpful but it's not uh, that uh, okay it's not that helpful right so it it um, definitely re removes the regularization biases here okay so like uh, the question is like wh what is remaining here well it turns out like what is remaining here is an overfitting bias and it's not obvious that there is an overfitting bias because while well, we're using random forest it's a very sophisticated machine learning tool introduced by Leo Breiman. Many uh, people have worked on this and so on. Leo Breiman told us the uh, random forest does not overfit. We can take this statement for granted. I mean, he gave no proof. We can take his statement for granted and say, well, there's, I say there's overfitting bias here, and maybe Leo Breiman says there's no overfitting bias here. But I can always verify it by doing sample splitting. So what I'm going to do next, I'm going to I'm going to do sample splitting. I'm going to use part of the data to train the G and alpha, my non-parametric components. And I'm going to use the other part of the data, the second part of the data, to estimate my causal effect. OK? And if I do this, I see that uh, the bias disappears, just disappears. So we were 2.5 standard deviation away. And now the bias is uh, zero. So there is overfitting, and this sample splitting removes it, right? Okay. Actually, in practice, we use something more complicated than uh, just sample splitting. We use cross-fitting, where um, you use, uh, let's say, you use like, part of the data to learn um, G and alpha part of the data to learn the causal parameters. But you can swap the roles of the samples and get the second estimate in this way. And then you average everything together. And you can be even more sophisticated about this. But the like, sample splitting is the easy way to, to get an idea for what's going on. So to sum it up, we have a regularization bias. OK, so we started here. We removed the regularization bias. Then we removed the overfitting bias. And we ended up with this. So we, and we actually, yeah, we ended up with a practical uh, recipe for, for doing causal inference. So here, to sum up, so this uh, debiased uh, machine learning is a generic recipe uh, that uh, isolates the narrow path to high quality causal inference in high dimensional settings. It's a method of moments estimator, right, which is good because, yeah, we're all familiar with GMM and method of moments. It relies on this debiased um, or or Neiman orthogonal uh, moment conditions. It relies on sp uh, sample splitting in the form of cross-fitting. And, um, 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 and also, this automatic learning of risk representers is very helpful for, uh, for, for, many, uh, for many applications. So the end result here is, is that is, it gives us a root n consistent approximately normal estimate of the causal effect. So this is abbreviated sometimes as scan in, uh, in, uh, in, in empirical, uh, sorry, in, in, in econometrics books. So it has a scan property. And this uh, recipe ap uh, actually applies more generally beyond, uh, beyond the examples that I talked about. So this is the big picture. My slides uh, also have these technical sections that are start, and I'm not going to cover them today in the lecture, but feel free to, to study them at, 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 at your own uh, time or not. Um, I just want to mention, so I, I, kept, I kept mentioning this Neiman orthogonality. I just want to define it, like what, what I mean by this, right? So here in, in our examples, we were using this representation for the target parameter. So this was the one piece of the representation, but we had this bias correction part. And we say this is Neiman orthogonal because if we, if we look at this formula and we perturb the g's and alphas around their true values, to the first order, the per perturbations are zero. So formally, we compute the, the derivative with respect to the g and alpha, and this derivative vanishes. And it's easy to verify this from um, 
uh, this property in this um, example. So this is, uh, this is robustness, or this is some kind of local robustness property, right? So this is, uh, this is the property that, um, that I was mentioning. So we are using device or the Neiman orthogonal moment scores to set up the learning here. Okay. All right, so then, uh, so we're gonna take this to data later on. I'll show you an empirical example later on. But before we go to the empirical example, I wanna talk about an even bigger bias problem. Uh, this uh, a bigger bias problem arises when we don't observe some of the confounders. So like, let's assume that A is no longer observed. So we have a omitted variable bias problem, right? Okay, yeah, we don't observe A. We can, all, of course, always run our short regressions, right? Like, uh, okay, so we're gonna, uh, we can run, uh, we can still run uh, the short regression of Y on D and X and obtain this short regression function G sub S. Um, this is going to be the projection of the long regression on the shorter list of uh, variables, D and X. And given the short regression, we can compute the short parameters, theta s, that we can view as approximation f uh, approximations for the, uh, for the target parameters theta, right? So, so here we have this uh, theta s, this, uh, theta s formula. So for the average causal effect, well, it's gonna be analogous to what we had before. So ideally we would like to have a long regression in there. We don't have long regression available to us. So so what we do, we run the short regression and we compute analogous expressions, right? So here it's the average difference between the two regression functions. For the derivatives, you take the average derivative of the short regression function. So our goal is going to be to provide bounds on the immediate variable bias under the assumptions that limit strengths of confounding here and actually provide a formal statistical inference on the size of the bias. And so here inspiration is drawing from the recent work by, uh, by, by Joel Tonji, Emily Oyster, uh, Sinelli and Hazlitt, and this is all set up in a parametric linear model. So we can do all of this analysis actually in in partially linear and fully nonlinear uh, models, okay? So this is, and it's gonna be super simple as well, okay? So it's gonna, just as, I would say, just as simple as, as in linear regression. So that's gonna be our goal. So I'm gonna present these results in the, in the following uh, framework. So I'm gonna formalize everything now. So we have this short list of regressors, WS. We no longer observe A our short parameter is going to be given by the application of the same uh, formula. So there's gonna be the average over M applied to a data vector WG and, and, and in, uh, GS. So we had the, the long regression function uh, there before. Now we have the short regression function. And we're gonna require that this formula when evaluated at the short regression only depends on the short list of regressors. So that's actually trivially satisfied in all the examples um, that I gave you. And again, the go our goal is to characterize the emitted variable bias here for the difference between the short estimate and the long, and to provide inference on the size of the bias under um, assumptions that are gonna limit the strengths of confounding. So it turns out that the key to getting the admitted variable bias is going to be, again, the Ritz representation. So we can represent this short, the short parameter, short statistical parameter. It's no longer causal, but it's an approximation to a causal quantity. We can represent this as the in inner product or covariance between the short regression function and the short Ritz representer. And the, the Ritz representer, the short re, uh, representer itself could be seen as a projection of the long representer on the shorter list of regressors. So here we have this, uh, the short representer is the projection of the long representer on the shorter list of regressors. And uh, this second lemma uh, is gonna give us uh, the following results. So we can, we can 
we can, uh, it's a short work, it's basically three lines of proofs after having two lemmas to, to verify that the difference between the short and long parameter is going to be the covariance between two terms here. So this term here is the uh, regression error. This is the reads uh, representer error. So these errors result from dropping latent confounders, right? So when we drop these A's, we make errors. So one, we make error in the regression, we make the error in the representation, and the bias is just the covariance of the two errors that we make. So then uh, we can uh, look at the square, uh, square bias here and rewrite it as rho squared times b squared, where b squared is product of the variances. So like one part here is the variance of the regression error, uh, this part here variance of the representation error, and rho squared here is the correlation or the r squared between the two parts. And of course, this is trivially upper bounded by b squared because, well, correlation is um, correlation squared is less than one, right? And of course, this is Cauchy Cauchy Schwartz. Um, so this upper bound here is the product, yeah, of the additional variations that the emitted confounders generate in the regression error, in the regression function, and the uh, and uh, the rep representer. So it turns out that, yeah, th th it sounds like, okay, this bound, the upper bound is, is maybe loose, um, but it turns out to be uh, uh, that this bound is sharp in, in the following sense, that this f bound is always attainable if the nature um, is adversarial. So if the nature plays the minimax game uh, against us, the nature can always choose the regression error to be proportional to the Ritz represent, uh, uh, representation error. So that's gonna set this, uh, that's gonna set this correlation to one, and so we can always hit this upper bound, right? So in that sense, the bounds are gonna be uh, sharp, so we cannot do better. And so, yeah, so this, uh, yeah, uh, so this is like, yeah, I, I would say, yeah, this is super simple result. Again, it's obtained in three lines. And we would like to take it to that data, right? But to take it to data, I, I want to I wanna play with the bias a little bit more. So I'm going to factorize uh, this bias square into three components, the scale, S, and then CY and CD. CY and CD will be measuring the strengths of confounding in Y and the strengths of confounding in the treatment D, okay? So the scale is going to be learnable from the data. So the scale here is going to be learnable from the data. So this is a product. This is the variance of the short residual. So we run the short regression, we get the residual. This is the variance of the short residual times the vari and, and, and here the, the, this is the variance of the sh uh, short Ritz representer. So this is something that we could get from the data, estimate from the data. So then this CY and CD, they are rewritten in terms of the R squares. Just in, like in, in linear models, people like to think about the R squares. So here as well, we can think of R squares. So the R square, like over here in the first factor, is gonna be measuring the proportion of residual variance in the outcome that is explained by the omitted confounders. And likewise here in the second factor, uh, it's going to be measuring the proportion of the residual variance of the long representer that is ex explained by the omitted confounders. Okay. So this is the interpretation, and this is a general interpretation that applies to uh, to every e example. You could specialize it further if you want, um, but um, anyway. So this is good enough for us to take this to to the data. So here's the big picture. So here the bounds on theta will take this form. So the upper lower bound, theta plus, theta minus, could be written as the short, uh, sh the short parameter plus minus the scale, 
or the scale is learnable from the data times CY times uh, CD. CY and CD are not learnable from the data. We will, we will have to make the assumptions about what they are, just like uh, Joel Tonji or Emily Oyster do, do, do make these assumptions when they, uh, when they do uh, this, this sensitivity analysis for the linear regression models. So we're going to make assumptions about the strengths of confounding by, the, by latent variables. And these, uh, these assumptions are going to pin down CY and CD for us. Once these are pinned down, then we have the, the we have the bounds, and um, then we we can go ahead and estimate the short uh, the short parameter by the technology, the device machine learning of the first part of the lecture, and then we can also estimate the scale again using deviasing uh, deviasing and cross uh, cross fitting um, ideas, and then as a result we get consistent and as, uh, asymptotically normal um, estimators, theta hat, plus minus, for the bounds, right? So th this is the big picture. So we, using this t technology, the de de device learning technology, we can estimate the components of these formulas And we get uh, we we get root and consistent uh, approximately normal estimators for for the for, for the um, for the bounds, and from that it's a short work to get the confidence bounds for the bounds. Okay. Okay. So and here over here uh, I'm gonna skip the details. So the it's not. Uh, um, um, yeah. I'm going to skip the technical details for your own study and go to the empirical, uh, p empirical example. So in this em empirical example, we're going to revisit the study of Paterba, Venti, and, and Weiss. It was, uh, the first study was published in KG, and they have like several, uh, several other um, works. So here, the, the, uh, we want to study the effect of 401k eligibility on uh, net financial assets. The background is that, well, 401k uh, program is the um, tax-deferred private uh, um, savings plan. So you could contribute. If you worked in the US, like you know, like you, you know this super well, like, yeah, like every year you could contribute uh, let's say up to fifteen thousand dollars into 401k. It's tax deferred, so you can invest this in, into stocks. And then, let's say, when you retire, um, you get to uh, you get to uh, you get to withdraw uh, you, you you get to withdraw the money. Okay, so here. So the Paterba Venti. So, so the an, another background on the story is that well, the the 401k was popularized in 1990. Like formally launched in 1990, and three or four years later, Paterba and Venti and Weiss collected the data and look at the impact of the 401k uh, plan on the net financial assets. So, why is our um, outcome variable? The policy variable here is going to be this D, and it's going to be the eligibility to enroll in the 401k program. Okay, and and I'm going to use this causal diagrams here to illustrate uh, to illustrate the the reasoning here. So, like, yeah, we're interested in this causal effect of D on Y. Also, uh, we're going to have worker characteristics in the picture, such as income, education, and age. Potentially, we would like to have firm characteristics, but they are not measured, right? Like they're just not available to us. Uh, we could have uh, other latent variables jointly determining firm and uh, worker characteristics in the labor market. So F and X are determined uh, through in the labor market. And at least at the time the 401k plan was introduced, the workers weren't basing their employment decisions depending on whether the firm um, was offering 401k or not. So just it, it started, and at the time it started, um, pe people were not internalizing 
um, internalizing this uh, 401k eligibility. So one, one could argue that there is no, there is no, uh, there is no causality from D to X here, right? So that's in, that's important to the uh, identification argument of uh, Paterba, Venti, and Weiss. So anyway, so this is our causal diagram, and even though this diagram has latent like latent variables, f the firm characteristics, the use the general factors here, it turns out that in this diagram, conditioning on worker characteristics is sufficient. Okay, so we wanna we wanna uh, get this co the average causal effect of. So yeah, we wanna get this h here. The, there are sources of non-causal statistical association between Y and D. So they are realized through the common causes. So the X is a common cause, so we need to control for it. U is also a common cause, and F is a common cause. But what happens here, X is blocking all of the other non-causal channels. So you the Pearl like talked about this like backdoor pass. So there's backdoor pass from Y to X to U, F, and D. But it turns out that uh, when you condition an X, you, you, you block all of this backdoor path. And so this identification um, conditioning on X here works. So basically, you could view that as a formal justification for the identification strategy of Paterba, Venti, and Weiss uh, that they did. So controlling for X is sufficient. So if we, if we, accept, uh, if, if we uh, accept this causal diagram, we could say, okay, we, we, we don't have any immediate variable bias problems, and we can go ahead and do our causal inference. Okay, so here I'm gonna do causal, like average causal effect estimation using machine learning. And I'm here reporting the results by income groups. So this is, like here you have income, um, income, in, income groups by quartiles. On the vertical axis, you have the estimated average treatment effects and as well as the confidence bounds. Like overall, the, the average treatment effect is about 10,000, slightly lower than that. And the effect is quite heterogeneous. So for high-income uh, workers, it's almost 20,000. For low-income workers, it's below 5,000. Okay. So I'm using here machine learning, and the question is like, okay, what I'm like, why do I need machine learning here? Like, I, the, my variables are not that high-dimensional. Well, actually, if you're doing um, if you're doing non-parametric estimation, even having like the modest number of variables turns it into like a pretty high-dimensional problem, formally speaking. Anyway, so I'm getting these results. This is still like, why does it empirically matter? Okay, I could say, yeah, theoretically it matters, but why does it empirically matter? Well, it turns out that if I just run the simple linear models here, I get, I get the average effect of just 5,000. So I'm, I'm, I'm an order of magnitude off. So if I, if, I, if I was naive and just like was happy with my linear regression, I would, I would underestimate the effect a lot. Here, by using this non-parametric, modern non-parametrics machine learning, we're getting much larger estimates of the effects. Like when you see the, these two sets of estimates, you could say, wh like, what's wrong with my linear model? So it turns out that to make the linear models work, you need, we need, have to go back and throw in all, like all kinds of polynomials in income, education, um, age, and then you can make the work the like the, you can make the linear model work just as well as this machine learning, but that requires a lot of work. And with machine learning, just press the press the button. Yeah, you can just do the stata, right? Stata has machine learning now, right? So you can do stata and get pictures like this. I mean, this is not stata, but but R. But anyway, same picture, same story. So we get this uh, result, and and so um, you could. Yeah, even though like, yeah, sophisticated linear model here will do uh, equally good job, you could view this machine learning as a way to maybe validate or improve your linear uh, models. Okay, that completes the part of the analysis. But then I'm gonna go back still uh, to this 401k story and say, okay, wait a minute. Uh, Part of the 401k plan is actually the match amount that the employers offer, right? So I, uh, if you work at the university in the, in the States, they're likely matching 100% of your contribution to 401k up to 5% of your income. 
So there's going to be this match amount that that non-trivially affects your uh, for, like for financial wealth. So if you contributing fifteen thousand, like the the university could be matching of, uh, about the same amount. So you basically double your investment, and surely it has the effect on on the uh, net financial assets. And now it's hard to argue that the match amount is not going to depend on the firm characteristics, right? So there's going to be a link, causal link, from the firm characteristic to the match amount and to the Y. Firms are quite heterogeneous. Some, some are generous, some, some are not, some are private, some are public. Um, so there's going to be this causal link. And we are worried about this causal link because it does create a source of bias, immediate variable bias. It creates the, uh, um, a source of non-causal statistical association between Y and D. So F now is a common cause for D and Y. And we are worried about this, um, the bias that this creates for the inference. Right? So now, uh, this is the second causal the diagram. And I would say it's probably more plausible than the previous one. And for this causal diagram, controlling for X is no longer sufficient. We do need to control for F. But F is not available. So F is our A. And now we can go ahead and do the bounds analysis for this problem. To do the bounds analysis, I need to specify my confounding scenario. So for the confounding scenario, we're going to do the following. So the first, uh, we're going we're gonna, to uh, come up with a hypothesis of the strength of, uh, of confounding in Y. So let's assume that the uh, assumption that F explains, yeah, we will assume that F explains as much variation in the net financial assets as the total variation of the maximal matched amount of income over the period of three years. It's very, very conservative assumption that I'm making here. And similarly, we could also posit a hypothesis on the strengths of confounding in, in the treatment. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip the explanation here. Just, uh, um, um, and I just want to say, yet yeah, this, uh, by all measures, this is also going to be a conservative uh, hy hy hypothesis that we make. And what this uh, scenario does for us, it pins down this number CY and CD. So now that we have these numbers, we can do, um, we, we can do our uh, bounds learning. And this is what we get from the, um, uh, for the bounds analysis. So, be, uh, so, so here we have this picture, the same as before. This is our short estimate. The black curve is the short estimate. The red curve are the estimated bounds, and the blue curves are the confidence bounds for the bounds. And what we see, actually, uh, uh, even though, yeah, there is an immediate variable bias, issue here the results of the, the result of 401k increasing, um, increasing net financial assets is actually robust to this confounding scenario that I talked about in the sense that uh, High-income workers, they, they still benefit from the plan. Maybe it's less clear for the low-income workers, but they, they still benefit from, the, uh, from having this plan, um, at least in the short run, right? You could, uh, so now I'm heading to, towards conclusion. So you could say, okay, may, maybe uh, the scenario that you presented to me is not a good one. Maybe I would like to entertain my own scenario. You could actually do this by using the sensitivity contour plots. So for example, I could look at the estimated contours of the lower bound as a function of the strength of confounding in the treatment on the horizontal axis and the strength of confounding in the, in the outcome on the vertical axis. My confounding scenario was over here. If you, you could come up with your own confounding scenario and you could, get, uh, you could get conclusions, kind of automatic conclusions from just one plot. And you could also do this with confidence. So there's a confidence version of that yeah, as well. 
Anyway, I'm gonna um, uh, I'm gonna just mention that this line of work builds on uh, some of the classical ideas that go back to Niemann in the 50s, Levit and Khazminsky, Ibrahimov in the 70s. This is a Soviet uh, Soviet uh, like mathematical statistics work. Um, the, there was a lot of on the work on semi-parametrics that we're building off. Uh, there's related work on Debye's, the double loss of, of the early 2010s. There's related work by on targeted maximum likelihood. Uh, they all, like, all of these are about getting these debi de debiasing um, methods. Uh, the, the automatic learning of reads representers that I talked about is newer part, and, and the bias bounds is completely new. It's just uh, off. Uh, um, the, we just put out, uh, like we put out the MDR working paper uh, a month ago, maybe two, two weeks ago, actually, yeah, anyway. So here are the uh, takeaway points. So yeah, using ML to learn causal effects in high dimensional settings is potentially very fruitful, but tricky because of regularization and over overfitting biases. The DML eliminates these biases by using orthogonal scores and cross-fitting. We do need a high quality learning of regressions and the representers, and this auto-automatic learning of representers is very helpful in, uh, in, 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 in the empirical work. And finally, we can now deal with the bigger uh, bias problem, the immediate variable bias. Yeah, this bias cannot be removed, but we can, uh, we can bound this uh, bias and perform statistical inference on the size of the bias. Thank you very much. Victor, thanks for a great talk as always. Uh, I, want, I want to try and a little bit under, understand. So suppose you've got an RCT. So uh, by, by construction, your D variable is uh, orthogonal to, to every uh, baseline. Uh, you would still use this approach, right? To uh, try and improve precision or you know, could you? How does, it, how does it work in that uh, in that context? If you have uh, yeah, if you have RCT, you don't have um, confounding, but you have precision issues. Yeah, you have precision issues, so you could still use this approach. Obviously, if to learn the the representer, you in RCT you would know it's so the trivial, like you're not gonna if if you know the p scores like the propensity scores in RCTs. Yeah. You're not going to use machine learning to learn them. You're just going to use the uh, use them directly, right, mm -hmm. as estimators. So that simplifies part of the problem. The other the other part you could see, yeah, you you still want to learn the regression to improve the precision of the RCT um, estimates. Uh, uh, using this kind of uh, of, uh, of search for for, uh, for control variables for the appropriate control variables that could help you. Yeah, it helps. Yeah, with precision. No, I mean, in practice, not not a lot, but yeah, it helps with precision. Yeah, um, for sure. But you know, RCT are a bit idealistic, and also a lot of uh, RCTs in economics actually are not RCTs. There is some randomization, but they are not RCTs. In what sense? There is randomization, but there is. Uh, oh, it's, uh, not, uh, it's kind of natural randomization where you don't know the process or something like that. You uh, well, uh, yeah, you you you. Yeah, you sometimes you do know the process, but you don't model the process. You don't. Uh, you you have a you, you you basically have stratified RCTs. You have P of Zs that the potentially the the propensity scores are potentially knowable, but if you look at the empirical papers, they don't actually um, they compute the P, the propensity scores. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. It's always inspiring, and it's also been a huge inspiration for my own research. Hi, here in the back. Oh. Um, what I wanted to ask is uh, if you were able to point out the difference from the debias machine learning compared to the semi-parametric efficiency literature, if there is any, or if it is just a different term for the same? 
Well, at the beginning I said uh, in low dimensional non-parametrics, like the white path is possible. And so semi-parametric literature of the 90s was about this white path. So for example, you could use the propensity score formula, the horowitz thompson transform. You estimate propensity, score, like propensity scores by kernel methods, and that's going to get you full efficiency. So you don't need, need to worry about the stuff that I talked about if you're in, in low dimensional non-parametric case. Or if you're doing regression matching by series, you also don't need to worry about all of this stuff. So semi-parametrics is about the white path, but it turns out that there is a part of the semi-parametrics semi contain this narrow path. This was actually recognized by Levit and Ibrahimov Hazminsky in the early, um, well, in the, in the mid 70s, but people didn't pay attention to it. So, uh, so basically, this is like kind of focusing the attention on the narrow path at the same time cranking out the theorems for the relevant class of examples that are important to us as a field, right? So, say, Ibrahimov Hazminsky was about density estimation and inference on the functionals of the density estimators. So clearly, like a different cl class of problems, the ideas were the right ideas. And so this is, you could see this as a continuation of work uh, in, that, uh, in, the, in, that, uh, in that regard. So, yeah. Thank you.